Right now, the day's biggest news stories from a Vegas perspective. This is the Vegas Take with Sharp and Shapiro. All right, welcome back. It is the Vegas Take. Sharp and Shapiro coming up at the bottom of the hour. It is porn week in Vegas. Well, what do, what do I mean? Well, I guess every day is porn week in Vegas. But anyway, the reason why I bring that up is the AVN Expo Award and the award show. It is like the Oscars of the porn industry. It's coming to town and uh, day one is tomorrow. So to preview that, uh, a lovely young lady who is going to be joining us in studio coming up here in just a little bit. Her name is Allura Jensen, and she is nominated for an award for most attractive MILF. I'm sorry, I had to. La- I have to laugh when I say that because it's funny. But anyway, she's going to be coming in studio to uh, join us and preview the AVN Expo and the AVN Awards. So that'll be fun coming up here in just a few minutes. Got to talk a little football. Obviously, we were at uh, Superhost. Steve Sears' house. Well, I was. JD couldn't make it, but I, I was there with some friends of the show. And he always throws this big party. He's, uh, if you don't know who Steve Sear is, he's one of the most popular casino hosts on the planet. And he's a big Kansas City Chiefs fan. So we had a party over there. We had a great time. And, you know, uh, I, I picked chalk, so to speak, last week. And I said, I believe the Chiefs and the Niners will be in the Super Bowl. And I'm going to my original pick, which was two months ago. And I said that the Chiefs were going to win it all. So here are my thoughts on both games, J.D., and, and uh, why don't we start with the Chiefs games? I thought Pat Mahomes was tested, played a very good Tennessee team, and I think they made the plays that they needed to make to win. He had a couple fantastic throws. Uh, he scrambled. How many times did we see Pat Mahomes run for first down yardage? Uh, he is just such a great playmaker. He is a superstar, and I truly believe he's going to win multiple championships, and I think it's going to be this year. So Tennessee had a great run. And I know you had a future bet on Tennessee, which was a good bet because I'm sure you made money on it because I don't think anybody thought they'd get as far as they they, they went. But uh, I give a lot of kudos to the Kansas City Chiefs. It just feels to me that is their time. Now, let me give my quick opinion, and then I'll just let you roll. Uh, my quick opinion on the other game. Obviously, San Francisco's defense is very, very good. And Aaron Rodgers was pathetic. And you look at his stats and say, wait a second, wasn't he 20 for 27? Well, yeah, but in the first half, he fumbled the ball twice and he threw an interception. All three of those led to touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken. That's 21 points you take off the board. I'm sorry, but your future so-called Hall of Famer cannot play poorly in a game like that. I don't care if he was 20 for 27. You know what? He fumbled the ball twice and he threw an interception all in the first half. That's 21 points that should have been taken off the board from San Francisco. You're putting your defense in a very, very bad situation. Aaron Rodgers was awful. With that being said, the Packers' defense was pretty bad also, and San Francisco deserved to win. But here's the thing about Garoppolo that I will say. All he did was was hand the ball off the entire game. I think I saw some stat where he only had to throw the ball six or seven times the whole game. He was not battle-tested in this game. Mahomes has a little bit more experience than Garoppolo does in these types of games. Now, I understand that Mahomes has never been in a Super Bowl before. I get that. But the reason why I like the Chiefs in this game is because, in my personal opinion, Mahomes is more battle-tested. Garoppolo is going to have to throw the ball. And San Francisco's defense, as good as it is, Mahomes is so athletic, and he's so good at getting out of the pocket and getting out of trouble. I think he's going to cause some problems for San Francisco, and that is why I like the Chiefs. J.D., take it away. Yeah, I don't think that it's so much as that he's so athletic. He's definitely a good athlete. He's better than Rodgers. <laughs> they, ju- they just have so many weapons. They have so much track. I'm talking 4-2, four, 4-3 four, speed guys with Sammy Watkins, Miko Hardman, Tyreek Hill, and then Travis Kelsey at tight end. And so you have to put you have to put guys, and then with, with Mahomes' ability to throw the ball 70, 75 yards legitimately uh, without much effort. I mean, he has an absolute cannon for an arm, as well as his vision. I mean, he's, he's, he's just he's, he's on the next level. Um, as far as being a creative quarterback, and and a lot of teams have a, have a difficult time dealing with that. But I think that one of the reasons why the Niners, and I, I'm totally agreeing with you here, I think the Chiefs win this game. I think it goes under. The Niners really took advantage of Green Bay Packers. They've 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 uh they they're not very big at cornerback. Kevin King, he's like six three, 190 pounds. He's not able to take on a, a George Kittle or an Emmanuel Sanders. 
because the the Niners wide receivers are very good at at, at run blocking. And I think that, you know, Jair Alexander, 180-pound quarterback, I think that the Chiefs cornerbacks with Brashad Breland and Kyle Fuller, they're a little thicker. They can handle the run a little better. You're not going to see those those sweeps. I mean, every time that the Niners did a toss play with you know, Raheem Mostert, against the the Packers, it went for 15 or 20 yards. I mean, every single time they averaged mm-hmm. 7.5 yards a carry on that day and they weren't called for holding once. And I actually, I watched the tape. I don't think they actually held once. That's not going to happen with the chiefs. The chiefs are actually very good against the run. They give up a lot of yardage, but they don't give up a lot of touchdowns and they're actually decent against the pass. They're, they're, they're their opponent's completion percentage against the pass is better than the 49ers, believe it or not. So, and, and you're right, Garoppolo, who's he going to throw to? Kittle, Sanders, JD, D- he's, D- D- he's going well, to be tested. I, I, he's definitely going to be tested, but I, I just think that it's not a great matchup for the Niners. I think the Chiefs win this game by 7 to 14 points. It's not even going to be that close, and I think it goes under. I'm looking at maybe a 28-17, under, under to the effect where a 7-point teaser won't even cover. So it could be it could be a total score of 45, so 46 of- points. What's up? Speaking of covering, since you just you know you're bringing up the gambling aspect right, sure, of it, yeah. uh, I knew this yesterday. I said this on Sunday. I said this is going to be a really bad day for the sports book. So this is up your alley. Yeah, they got uh, murdered. Jay Cornegay with the Westgate sports book said it was the second worst day of the football season for them. Mm-hmm. Boy, I'm just shedding tears for the Westgate. I really am. I feel so <laughs> feel so bad that they lost so many. But this was books all over the place, right? right? Uh, after paying out an enormous amount on the Chiefs 49ers teasers and parlays. Including a three hundred thousand dollar teaser to win two hundred grand at MGM, the books took a you know took a big plunge, so to speak. Uh, Kansas City closed at a seven point favorite. We all know that they covered, and uh, so anyway, what the point I'm trying to make is the books took a plunge. Uh, the Super Bowl line was out before that. Uh, that second game, the Packers game, was over with because I think we everybody assumed yeah, in the first at, half. At halftime, they yeah. were down what twenty eight nothing. So I, uh, a friend of mine, said I think. Uh, the Chiefs are going to be favored by three and a half. I said, no, you're crazy. He also said the over-under was going to be 47. I said, you're nuts. I said, the over-under is going to be in the 50s, probably 52. And I said, I guarantee you it's going to be close to a pick em. Well, that's about what it landed on. Now you're looking at the Chiefs as a slight favorite. I've seen the over-under jump from 52 and a half to 54. Everybody is betting the over. And uh, I think you're going to see a lot of late money on San Francisco. I wouldn't be surprised if this was a pick em before game time. What do you see? Yeah, I, I mean, as far as the money goes, yeah. Well, when you have a defense, defenses travel typically. Defenses win championships. But in a game like this, this defense doesn't really match up that well with the Chiefs. They've got one good cornerback in Richard Sherman. The Chiefs have three or four wide receivers that can that, – and they can all score a touchdown – pretty much immediately. I don't think that the Niners have the defensive personnel to match up with the Chiefs' weapons. But on the on the flip side of things, I don't think the Niners offensively have enough weapons to match up with the Chiefs' defense. The Chiefs, they still have Chris Jones. I mean, the, the Niners, you know, their vaunted defensive line, they had 48 sacks. The Chiefs had 45. There wasn't a big difference there. I, I think that the Chiefs' defense is very underrated. You're going to see Tyron Matthew have a big game. A, a lot of those a lot of those sweet plays, you know, against the Packers and their very young secondary, that's not going to happen against the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're be able to handle that rush. George Kittle will probably have a, a decent-sized game. He might score a touchdown, but I think you'll see a lot of field goals in this game. I believe it goes under, and I think the Chiefs, won, again, they won by 7 and 10 points. It's just it's just not a great matchup for the 49ers. Now, one thing that could happen, the Chiefs offensive line through the middle, we're talking center and guard. It's 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 weak. It isn't as good as it could be. I actually have them in I'm, I'm releasing a, my mock draft today and I actually have them drafting Shane Lemieux, the, the guard from Oregon in the first round, the right guard from Oregon. But I, I think that the Chiefs' interior line isn't great offensively, and the Niners can probably take advantage of that. But then when you have a guy like Mahomes who can get rid of the ball so quickly, he can scramble when he has to. I, I think this is this is actually a, a much easier game to handicap than a lot of people realize, and the Chiefs win this game going away. So a couple more uh, financial bets that I wanted to discuss over the weekend. One better uh, had a 6-1, to six-figure wager on the NFC title game. He collected just short of $1.2 million. Uh, this same better one. This same better won three hundred thousand dollars at the nine uh, on the Niners at minus eight. Uh, so he did very well. Uh, he also cashed a one hundred thousand dollar each on the 49ers first half and second half over twenty one and a half. So there's one guy that made a lot of money. The only sports book in town that made any money at all, and I mean the only, was CG Technology. And the director of CG Technology's response was, "Yeah, we won a peanut," which means they <laughs> barely. Barely made out. Okay, well, you know, because th- what happened was there was big, big money line parlays on the Chiefs and the Niners, and those went through. And I'm sure you you'll, you'll, you probably saw some parlays 
over Chiefs Niners or over over Niners Packers over Chiefs Titans. Yeah. But I do think that the books aren't being totally honest. I think there was a lot of money on the Titans. I know a lot of sharps that had big money on the Titans. Okay. Well, it wasn't is, me. That 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 is not being reported because yep. the Titans played so well against Baltimore. Yep. They played so well. They they beat they beat New England Patriots, mm-hmm. who beat the Chiefs last yep. year with this same team. So I th- I think that's being underreported. But let's but let's think about this. Aaron Rodgers with Devontae Adams, Alan Lazard. Who was, who was an undrafted free agent out of Iowa State, and Jimmy Graham, 31 of 38, three touchdowns, 330 yards against this vaunted, this very vaunted mm-hmm. 49ers defense. And Aaron Jones, was he was very yep. good out of the backfield as well. So I, the Chiefs have a lot more weapons mm-hmm. th- than the Packers have. They have a better defense ready for this type of mm-hmm. environment. And Mahomes, I think, at this point has a better – okay. Al Rodgers is, is a great quarterback, but Mahomes, to me – He's more effective with the weapons that he has, and and you know the Packers they didn't have a Travis Kelsey, the Chiefs do. I, th- I think this is actually a very lopsided matchup in favor of the Chiefs. So we will continue uh, as as the weeks progress. We got a few weeks here before the uh, this Super Bowl game. We will continue to break it down. We'll get a lot of special guests on, uh, and um, you know we both are taking the Chiefs on this one, and I've, I'm sticking with my guns. I want to move on now to the NHL and the Vegas Golden Knights. Obviously, it was a very uh, interesting week to say the least for the Vegas Golden Knights firing their head coach Gerard Gallant. Uh, I'm laughing because I just thought it was utterly ridiculous. Uh, and uh, Gerard Gallant has been very quiet, but he has been uh, making some statements uh, in his hometown of Summerside. Uh, speaking to uh, a member of the media, and we do have some quotes that we want to share with you. So uh, this is what uh, Gerard Gallant said. He said, quote, you don't see something coming like that when you have two and a half years in. He Gallant uh, told the paper in, in his hometown, as I mentioned, he said, I was disappointed and surprised, but I understand the hockey business and things have to change sometimes. They made a tough decision, and I'm sure it was tough on them, but that's the way hockey is. Keep in mind, Gallant wants to coach somewhere else, and he understands that, so he's not going to trash the Knights. He also went on to say, I was an all-star coach a week and a half ago, and we were in first place in our division, and then things changed, and we lost four in a row. He said, they made a decision. It isn't too popular with me, but it is what it is, and you have to move on. I'm not going to worry about the past. I'm going to look at the future, and that's what you have to do as a coach. He also went on to say uh, the two and a half years were incredible. That first year was a magical season. If we could have capped it off winning the Stanley Cup, it would have been incredible. Second year was a really good year, too. We made the playoffs, battled hard. Up until I got fired, I had two and a half years of being really happy in Vegas. It's a good organization, a good team, and I was excited. If an opportunity comes up, I'll definitely look at it. Myself and Mike. He said Mike is a big part of what I do. He's talking about his assistant. And sometimes people forget about the assistant coaches. Mike is a good man. We have been together for a long time. It's not just me. Mike is a part of that, too. We will get ready, and hopefully something comes up. Something absolutely will come up. I thought it was a ridiculous decision by Vegas Golden Knights management. I think it was probably more ego and personal than it was results. I think this crap about, well, you know, they just weren't performing up to standards. Yeah, they were on a four- or five-game skid. He was still a few points at a first in the division. So absolute nonsense by the Vegas Golden Knights, and I thought it was cowardly to do this uh, and at least wait until the All-Star break. Don't do it when they're on the road. It was just complete nonsense. My opinion of it has not changed one iota. So I, uh, I'm i not going to say something positive about the Vegas Golden Knights in this specific situation. But let's move on to something that is positive. Let's move on to something that I tweeted out yesterday. I think this is a great story, and we want to get this kid on the show. His name is Marvin Coleman II. If you don't know who Marvin Coleman is, he is a walk-on at UNLV. And by the way, UNLV is off to a wonderful start in the division. I think they're second place in the Mountain West Conference behind San Diego State. They're off to a great start. TJ Otzelberger to this point has done a good job. They're, yeah, they're playing they're six and one in conference. Yeah, they're doing a good job. Yeah. And uh number one, I would say the effort is there. And Hardy's playing better basketball for the team, not for himself. So I've given TJ Otzelberger credit for that, and, and he's doing a good job so far. Uh with that being said, yes, it is an awful division, and I don't see UNLV a good enough team to make the NCAA tournament, maybe not even the NIT, because they don't really have any signature wins. With that being said, I want to bring up this kid, Marvin Coleman. As I said, he's a walk-on. Let me repeat that. This wasn't a kid that was getting a scholarship. He's a walk-on at UNLV. Mm. He just got the honor of the Mountain West Conference Player of the Week. This is unbelievable, and it's not really being covered as much as I think it should be because he's a good kid, and I think he is the yeah, one of And he's a local kid. Yes, and I think— He went to high school in Vegas. And he sets the example. Here's what I mean by that. Now, I give TJ and his coaching staff credit for holding players accountable. But I also think this kid, Marvin Coleman, is so well-liked, and he's such a hard worker in practice. 
and they see the work and the effort that he puts in. And the players talk about it all the time in these press conferences, right? And they're happy for him, for him being rewarded. And I think it's contagious. I really do. I think when you have a player like that on your team, that's a great teammate and well-liked, and that works his ass off and now gets rewarded, I think he is a huge part and a huge reason why this team is playing as well as they are. And by the way, there's nothing embarrassing about losing on the road to Boise State. Boise State's pretty good. And by the way, Utah State over the weekend, you want to talk about a complete disaster? You, changing the subject quickly here in the Mountain West, Utah State was on the road against Boise State. They were up 13 points with three minutes to go. They were up five points with eight seconds to go, and they found a way to lose the game. That Utah State team is going through a lot of problems right now. But anyway, I bring up Boise State because, you know, UNLV lost to Boise on the road. It's their only loss in conference. That's not an embarrassing loss. Boise's a decent basketball team. But I said that UNLV was going to overachieve a little bit this year at the beginning of the year. They were picked seventh in conference. I said they were going to pick fifth, but the way they're going right now, you can make the argument they could be third or fourth yeah. with, with wh- where they're going. But that, there's a lot of conference play still yet to be determined. But uh, kudos to Marvin Coleman. That's that's the logist of this. Kudos to him for being a walk-on kid, for for doing all the right things, playing hard. I, I, like I said, it's becoming contagious. The whole team is kind of buying in finally. I didn't say that a month ago. It was the opposite, quite frankly. The effort wasn't there. Hardy's playing better. Uh, they're without Dimitri Long. Let's remember that. And they're, they're playing, Wait, which is a good thing. Clearly, um, since since he's been off the team or since he's been injured, it's been a good thing for the team. And one thing I want to talk about here: Marvin Coleman, the last game he played, he had 11, 11, 11, and six. That's great. He had a triple double with six steals. It's incredible. I mean, that, that's unheard of. I think all that, this kid needed was a little bit of confidence. That rarely happens. I, yeah. Obviously, he's he's always been a great athlete, good enough defensively to lock down anybody. All now he's turned into a leader on the court, and he's reveling in the fact that he gets to play. You know, he, he he's in he's in Las Vegas. This is where he went to high school. He's got a lot of he's got a lot of fans here already, and he's taking advantage of the opportunity. And he's clearly setting a great example for his team. And you have to give T.J. Altsberger a ton of credit for this turnaround, Brian. I mean, this is this is crazy because to me, this roster is okay. It's fine. Then look at Bryce Hamilton. He had thirty five points last week. Mm-hmm. He's averaging now thirteen points a game. Bryce Hamilton. This would not have happened under Marvin Menzies. There was no chance. Or, I mean, or, or Dave Rice. And, and Bryce, he was a four-star guy. You know, he he's got a lot of he's got a lot of you know, lineage that basketball blood. He he comes from a good line of basketball players. He's clearly good. At, I think he's grown. I think he's more like six, 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 seven now. He's a plus athlete. You know, but Bryce Hamilton, I didn't expect this, this meteoric rise from him or or Marvin Coleman. So I, I mean, I have to I have to give T.J. Altsburg credit here for player development, and it's hard not to at this point. Well, what I what I put at the top of the list, uh, and I said this, I pointed this out three weeks ago, um, was the decision he made to hold players accountable. Yeah. And here's what I mean by that: you had players on this team, on this UNLV basketball team, that were uh, breaking team rules. Some of the stuff we don't know about, some of the stuff we do know about. We know that Tillman showed up late to a shoot around, and T.J. Altsberger suspended him for a game. Smart. Uh, we also know that Amari Hardy was not starting. There were several. There was a several game stretch there where he gave Coleman more minutes for his work hard work and practice, and Hardy was not starting. And it completely changed. I think when he decided to do that, it changed everything because you saw kids playing harder, particularly on the defensive end. The effort was there. I think if the effort is there with this team and the way they're playing right now, there's no reason why they can't compete for a title. They're obviously nowhere near as good as San Diego State, but you can make the argument that there's no reason why they can't compete for second, third, fourth in the conference and possibly give them an opportunity to make the finals of the Mountain West Conference Tournament. I think that would be a great year for T.J. Otzelberger. If he could somehow get them top four in conference, at minimum make the semifinals of the Mountain West Conference Tournament, I don't think they, they're good enough to get an IT appearance, even if that happened. And the reason why I say that is because they don't have any big wins. They don't. Yeah, I, I think UNLV is going to make the NIT, Brian. Give me one big win that Let, UNLV make, has. It doesn't matter. I think yes, if, it does if, matter. If, if they finish 20 and 12, or nineteen and twelve, or nineteen and three, they're going to make. They're going to make if, if they finish top three in the Mountain West, which I think at this point they are going to. I don't think they are. Okay, we'll, we'll say we'll say top four in the Mountain West, with, and they're twenty and twelve or nineteen and thirteen. They make the NIT. Let's. I'll make a wager with you right now. They make the NIT. So, what, what kind of odds do you want? So hold on a second. We'll get to that in a second. That's fine. So if they're fourth in conference, uh-huh. you're saying they're going to uh, the NIT is going to invite three teams to the in the Mountain West Conference into the NIT. Is that what you're saying? I think so. 
Okay, I disagree with That's you. Fine. I, the Mountain West, first of all, you have to look at their RPI. You have to look at mm-hmm. uh, their strength of schedule, and you have to look at quality wins. So I ask you this. You said it doesn't matter. I couldn't disagree with you more. Uh, getting an invite to any postseason tournament uh, wins matter, and signature wins matter. And I'm asking you this. Give me Now listen, if they beat San Diego State, I agree with you once. Give me one signature win that they have all year against a team that's top 100 in the country. You can't. Utah State. Okay. Utah State's one, okay. but but I will but I will add that, and that's the only one they have. Mm-hmm. I will also add that their starting center was out. And how many have they played? How many top 100 teams have they played? Uh, let's see. They played UCLA. That, are they top 100? Uh, I, I, think, think, I think they're 9-9. Nine and nine. Are they 9-9 nine yeah, nine right not now? Doing, they, they, just, they, they barely beat Cal yesterday. Or they, two days ago. They've played several uh, teams in my uh, – I'll have Can- to go back and look at the I, schedule. I think Kansas State is yes. – uh, they're, yes. uh, maybe they're 12-5 and five or 12-6. Yes. and six. Yes. Okay, so that's, and, they, and, they, and they lost to Kansas they're State. They're probably 75 but or to, but 60. But to – listen, if they beat Utah State on mm-hmm. the road, which, by the way, there's a possibility that could happen, um, or – and or – if they somehow find a way to split with San Diego State, who, by the way, is undefeated, they're a top five team in the country. I don't think that's going to happen. Do you think that they play San Diego State? And I, I put a poll up on Twitter about this yesterday. But do you think they play San Diego State tough this Sunday no. at the Thomas and Mac? No. I'm, I'm saying, no. what do you think the spread is? Absolutely not. So the, you've, got, you've got 11 and 9, or we'll, we'll call it 12 and 9 UNLV after they play San Jose State tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Or no, or no uh, who do they play? I've watched San Diego State play, and I'm telling you right now, I, I'd be shocked. What do, you think, what do you think the spread is going to be? Um, I think San Diego State probably minus nine. Minus nine. Yeah, and something you think, like that. And you think San Diego State covers that spread? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it might be six. It might be six and a half. If, if they lose, if UNLV loses by five to eight points at home, is that playing them close? Uh, uh, it depends on how the game, uh, listen, if they're down double digits the whole game and then they make well, a couple threes right. with two minutes to go. So you're that, asking that, me a that's, question. That's totally different. Animal. I will I totally answer agree. that question after the game. I think it depends on how the game goes. If they hang within six or seven the whole game, then of course the answer would be yes. But if they're down 15 points with three or four minutes to go and San Diego State takes their foot off the gas pedal, then I'm going to say no. It wasn't a competitive game. Do you understand what I'm saying? You look at of a course. score. You look at a score sometimes, and it doesn't usually give the whole story. So again, let's wait and see it. But no, to answer your question, I don't think they're going to be able to compete with San Diego State. Why? Quite simply, San Diego State has too many weapons. They have no weaknesses. They have NBA players underneath the basket, and they have an NBA player in Flynn who is their guard. They have great guard yeah, I, play, they have great centers, and they have great shooters. <laughs> so I don't, they don't have any weaknesses. You know, all, all indications tell me that Marvin Coleman is going to be able to guard Malachi Flynn. Though. I disagree. Amari Hardy and KJ no, Fegan, is there is there a giant different no, difference in talent there? Is Wetzel against Jong? I, I, I Jong's, just, Jong's probably a Wetzel's better not, Wetzel's not uh, – Wetzel, he's uh, – who? Jong Wetzel Wetzel against Jong talking that match. They're not guarding each other. Yeah, why would they not? They're both the fives. Okay, okay. I was thinking of somebody else. It's Matt Mitchell. You're, Matt yeah, Mitchell. Thinking, Mitchell, Mitchell, thought, Mitchell will, be, will be Nick Blair and Donnie Tillman, and then you've got Shakel and, and Jonah Antonio, two two players who are very similar. They're both good shooters. I don't think it's actually. It, and the one thing the one thing San Diego State has an advantage is depth. But besides that, I don't. And even with Bryce Hamilton playing that well, I'm not sure there's a San Diego State has as many advantages okay. as you think. They All do. due respect to Marvin Coleman, he has no chance of 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 of, of winning that battle. I would be shocked if he does. But, hey, that's why they play the games. Absolutely we'll have to wait. it is. We'll have to wait and see what happens. All right, coming up next, this is going to be a lot of fun, changing subjects, going from UNLV basketball to the Porn Awards. I, I, that's why I love doing this show. Anyway, coming up next, adult film star Allura Jensen will be joining us for an AVN preview. That's right, it's AVN week in town, and uh, she is also nominated for an award. We will talk to her about that in studio coming up next right here on the Vegas Take Sharp and Shapiro. Take a quick break. Be back right after this on the all-new 101.5 FM 720 AM K Don.